don't hesitate to drop questions or comments into the chat. We'll be watching that. Um, and, you know, as we kind of take you through the day, uh, don't forget to, you know, take time, hydrate. Uh, there's a lot that we're going to be dropping on you here. We'll be doing some breakout sessions. So, um, yeah, let's just go ahead and uh, dig right in. So for those of you who don't know, um, we're 6 8 Sports, um, and 6 8 Sports was developed a couple of years ago now to, as a company that really is focused on youth athlete performance analytics, right? Um, this idea that we're going to provide a safe, fun, age-appropriate training and development tools um, using technology. And we have sort of an AI system that we're going to get to a little bit later that sits behind the scenes on all the things that we, we talk about today. So, you know, as we are evaluating athletes and as we're, um, you know, providing these tools, there's a whole bunch of data analysis that's going on behind the scenes to actually, you know, provide that training, provide those recommendations, and at the same time, provide parents and athletes with a realistic picture of where their, where their kid and where their, their athlete is, is at at the current moment and where they're headed and how they benchmark and stack up against other kids um, in their peer group. So the 6-8 system is really designed to kind of track athletes over the course of their career, right? We've, uh, the idea was that we would, we would start with them in splash ball and we would evaluate and, you know, create these really fun drills um, that they could go through over the entire course of their career and really standardize and benchmark these performance analytics. Um, but then we also started to realize that there's other inputs that we needed, right? We couldn't rely on kids just getting to a camp every once in a while to, to do this, you know, to, to get this consistent picture of where an athlete is at and how they're performing and how the, they're evolving into the sport. Um, we had to come up with a whole bunch of different ways to gather data and to engage parents and, and athletes. So we're going to talk today about some of those tools um, and then Tony and Maggie and Rico are going to talk about techniques. Um, we've got uh, some other folks who are going to join us throughout the day too to kind of talk about the 6-8 program. So the outline for today, uh, we're going to start with Maggie Steffens, who's going to give us the state of the sport address. Um, and then we're going to go into uh, Q&A, uh, some breakout sessions. Um, then we're going to talk about the, the challenge and the importance of metrics and how we gather those metrics using technology um, and the tools that we have here at 6-8 Sports. Uh, we'll go into another breakout group toward the end, and then we'll come back for some final Q&A and, and closing remarks from Tony and Maggie. All right, so that sound good. Maggie, you, uh, you all set to take over? I think you're on mute. Let me see if I can unmute you. Hi, everyone. Um, just gonna share my screen here with all of you. So we're really excited you guys are all here. Thank you so much. I see people are starting to trickle in. Um, to us, it's really important to stick together during this time as a water polo community, which is why we're here today to kind of share what we're doing with 6-8, you know, our mission, our knowledge, but also learn from you guys. I'm really excited. I think everybody accepted um, on the email before to be a part of a coaching network. So hopefully after this conference, um, we can create a network where you guys can share ideas, share struggles, uh, share successes um, through our platform to kind of go the next step from here. So just some speakers we have today, Carl already mentioned, um, but we also have Brenda Via with us today, which we're really excited about. Um, obviously mentioned Ricardo, and then Tony and myself. So I already saw this in the chat, but 6-8 Sports was kind of born on this idea of a growth mindset. That's what we believe in at 6-8 Sports is every day is an opportunity to improve. And that's not just as individuals, but also you know, as a sport itself. So how can we improve in the water as athletes, as teams, as clubs, um, but also how can we improve as a water polo community? How can we grow this sport? How can we take it to that next level? And that's kind of where the, the title 6-8, the name came um, to us. Tony and I believe that every day you need to earn your number, which is a 6-8 sports motto. And in order to be on Team USA that, you know, Brenda as well with number four, we didn't pick those numbers, right? Those were given to us, number six for myself, number eight for Tony, um, and we had to earn those numbers and we're still earning them today. And so that's kind of where this, this growth mindset and this concept of 6-8 sports is of 
you know, growth. And so for us, our mission really is to grow the sport we love locally, but also take it to this global level. And we can do that through, you know, supplying access to high quality resources for everybody. Doesn't matter if you're here, you know, in a radius of where we live, it can be in Europe, you know, we have people here from South Africa, from Europe, from Australia, which is so cool, right? And so we can supply those, those resources to everybody. Um, and then also through innovation, I think it's so important um, to look at what we have today and how can we improve it. And by using data, by using analytics, we can use innovation to, to grow our sport. Um, and then and simply make your lives easier as coaches, make your lives easier um, as heads of federation, as heads of clubs, that's really important to us. So if we dive into a little bit the state of the sport, this will be brief. Everyone knows more or less the water polo community, but just kind of want to shine some light on it. Um, right now, at least in the U.S., I know we have people from all over the world, but we're kind of just using the U.S. as a, as a case study. Um, we have about 75,000, a little under 80,000 water polo athletes from the age 8 to 18. Worldwide, we have a little under 210,000. What's funny is you look at swimmers, so it's the same resource as a pool, right? And they have about five times as many swimmers as we do as water polo players. So to us, we see the resources are there, the pools are there, the opportunity is there, but we're lacking in, you know, grabbing that opportunity and even retaining our athletes. And one of the problems we see is location specific water polo players. You know, we, we have a lot of um, people in California or in Florida, or, you know, Tony and I have both played in a lot of countries all over the world. And a lot of times where we play is pretty much the water polo hub. So how can we provide that quality to other places around the world? Um, also, the state of the sport, we talk about the challenges, which I'm sure all of you in your head can think of a million, but we've kind of categorized it into one, lack of exposure and opportunity. You know, can we get that exposure that these other sports get, basketball, soccer, water polo, or swimming, et cetera, um, and, and even with pool access. Two, lacking data and technology, pretty much very behind in that category, which is where 6 8 Sports is excited to step in. Um, I think one thing you can think of is Tony Azevedo, friend of Via, four and five time Olympians. And I couldn't tell you how many games they've played, how many goals they've scored, um, nothing, right? I can tell you how many medals they have, but how can we use their success to help grow the sport in the youth level? Next, no standardized metrics or metric system. This is seen in all other sports. Tony's gonna dive into the 6A challenge later. Uh, lack of knowledge, you know, just, trying to supply knowledge to as many people as possible, and then poor role model exposure. You know, if we don't have the exposure of, for example, a Tony or Brenda as much as possible in comparison to like a Steph Curry and these soccer players everywhere, we can gather more water pole players. So just a quick case study, we thought this was pretty cool. If we look at the Olympians we have now, or that have been in the, the past Olympics for water polo, these are the states they're from, and the red dots are more or less the clubs. Um, we didn't put all of them in, but mainly the ones that have a good quantity. And to us at 6-8 Sports, it's not necessarily about quantity. Of course, we want to grow the sport, but can we grow the quality? So can in the next, you know, four, eight, 12 years, can we now have an Olympian from each of these clubs, not just those three or four you saw on the previous slide? And that's going to come with providing the resources that we have um, through the network we have, the 6-8 mobile app, which we'll dive into a bit more. Um, you know, consulting services. And in the future, we have some pretty excited things coming. Um, but we want to provide these resources to everyone. Doesn't matter who you are, where, where you're living. Anybody can get on the mobile app. Anybody can be a 6-8 athlete. Anybody can join the 6-8 team. Um, just some stuff we're doing at home right now during quarantine. Um, everyone has access to this, which is awesome. We've created a ton of videos for challenges kids to do at home. We've come up with circuits here for um, dry lands. And then of course, we also have all of these water videos that Tony and I have created um, to just help not only the athletes learn and practice, but also as coaches, just see you know, how we do things. It's not necessarily the perfect way, but it's how we do it and how we've kind of gotten to, to where we are today. And then another feature we have on the app that we're doing at home in, in uh, quarantine right now is 
the six, eight game scoring system, which parents can do, right? Athletes can do when we have games, you can live stat score, as you can see on this, this screen here but we realize that nobody's playing water polo games right now. So what me and Tony have created is we've sent out a challenge, a few challenges every week to watch a specific player. So for example, on the right, um, I recently watched a game of Russia versus Spain, the European championship game, and I just watched Micah Garcia. And these are her stats from one quarter. And we tell all these kids to watch them. So that's something that's really cool that all of you guys can do if you want as well is you know, teach these kids to start watching elite athletes and follow them um, and using this game scoring system. So those are just some quick resources we're using in quarantine. But for us at 6-8, you know, we really just want to grow the sport and, and grow the quality um, and provide as many resources as we can to, to all of you guys. So we're going to head into some quick Q&A to start uh, before we head out into our breakout groups. So I'm going to stop the share here, I think. So I can read off the first question um, for, for Brenda. Um, you know, was there a defining moment that helped you get to where you are in the sport? And what was that moment? Um, there's a few moments that come to mind, but the one that I want to share with everyone today is one that happened early on in my national team career. Um, it happened just as we got a new coaching staff in 1998 as women's water polo was put into the Olympic program. Um, there was a summer where there was only a training trip to be had because world championships had happened in January. I had made that world championship team. I was really excited and stoked to be a part of Team USA and kind of working towards, you know, all my goals. And that summer with the new coaching staff with Guy Baker just on, um, he wanted to see just other players and I remember you know working my butt off at training camp then having this one-on-one -on -one meeting and he's like you know this summer we're just going to leave you home and you're going to focus on the junior team and we really need you to just kind of lead the junior team and to me that was a huge slap in the face I felt so it was just something that that I carried and I remember moving forward to next summer um, getting ready for junior worlds the national team and the junior team were um, training together and I remember after that training camp, Guy pushed, pulled me aside and was like, Brenda, why don't you always play like this? We need you to play like this on the national team. And I just kind of looked at him like, okay, I can do that. I can take over. And he's like, yes. But in my mind, I was thinking, I was just proving myself to you. You saw me as this 5-4 driver and didn't really give me a shot at the beginning. So I was going to prove you wrong. So it's just... You know, for me, it's always been about being confident, um, knowing the skills and the water polo IQ that I have, regardless of my height. So that first little setback failure to me has always kind of reminded me that I need to believe in myself, regardless of um, what coaches may think of me. What is your best advice to give teenagers um, and kids during this time of COVID? Yeah, so um, what's up, everybody? Uh, excited to do this today and have everyone here. You know, this is obviously something I've been doing a lot of is keeping uh, teenagers engaged and talking to them, breaking down video and doing workouts. But I, I think the biggest thing that you as coaches can do is, is, is literally try and engage with them because <clears throat> the thing that they're going to miss most is – the memories, right? You look back at your teams and your careers, what you miss most is those memories, the, the, the hard times, the, the good times with all your teammates. So for me, now's a great time, you know, push one of your seniors to, to lead a workout once a week. Talk, have your seniors talk to the, the, the that didn't get this opportunity and have them talk to the, the upcoming younger freshmen or the, or the group and talk about maybe what they would have changed and, and, and how much this is going to, this meant to them. And, and don't take this for granted because we're, we're kind of all getting over this workout at home every day. And if you don't allow them, uh, if you tell them what to do on their own, most of them aren't actually going to do it. But now's the time to ju just keep that community going because our sport, that's what we feed off of, right? Basketball's home, but they got, they can shoot on their own baseball. Same thing. Water pool. We don't have a pool without a pool. We're all like anxious and don't know what to do with each other. So 
bring that community together and just constantly try to keep every other day you're doing something and use those seniors and leaderships in my opinion. Tony, that got me pumped. I like feel like I need to go do something right now. <laughs> um, the third question, so what are some culturally enhancing habits to help promote a positive and successful team atmosphere? Um, and then just also some examples of that. So kind of just piggybacking a little bit off of Tony and Brenda, I think one thing that has been really great in all the teams that I've been a part of is this sense of ownership as athletes. Even from a young, young age when I was on Diablo Club team, I remember, you know, we had my coach, Marino Tool, had kind of installed that it was our responsibility to, you know, when it came to the games, like we're the ones in the water. And so when it came to warm up, when it came to warm down, when it came to like talking in the groups, of course, she was our coach, she was our leader, but she kind of taught us how to take ownership of our team. And like Brenda was kind of talking about as, as being that leader in the water. And then later on, you know, I think to 2012, which is going to bring back some memories to Brenda is, you know, we were in the semifinal at the Olympic Games. Um, our coach, Adam, called a timeout with one second left, which, you know, we didn't have possession of the ball, it led to a five meter for the other team, which led to us going into overtime of semifinals at the Olympics. And we had created a sense of ownership within our own team. And so at that point, when you know, maybe your coach is flustered or you guys, right, are trying to figure something out. There was responsibility and accountability amongst each other as a group that made us, you know, face that adversity together. And I think that's something that's so important to create as a culture is <clears throat> provide that ownership um, to the group that you guys have. And that can be done by just, you know, putting them through challenges throughout. And then secondly, making sure that they have fun um, and creating that fun by letting them kind of be free. I think that's something that's been so important to us is you know, having that freedom to be ourselves and create that ownership um, within a team, you know, not necessarily the coach to the team. Okay, last question, which I'm really excited about. Tony, maybe you can answer this one first. When thinking about coaches that you've had, what do you think are some of the most impactful things a coach has done for you or said to you? So I really, there's two in my life and I'm gonna explain one later. So you know, going throughout my life, I, I, I didn't have a problem scoring goals. So I went into the games just thinking about how many goals I was going to score. And, and I can remember I went to my first national team game at 17 years old and I'm in Australia. And the first game I, I shoot three times, I scored nothing. Second game, I get two opportunities. I score nothing, but the non-scoring just got to my head, right? All of a sudden I was devastated. I couldn't play anything. And I ended up not playing any minute in that game. And this is, eight months before the Olympics. And this, I, you know, this was my first opportunity. I thought, you know, this, I have to show and prove myself, this young guy, I can make it. And I totally choked. Um, and so I was just, you know, devastated. And I remember in the airport, the great Monty Daskowski, who was a big mentor of mine and my father's, I uh, pulls me aside and he says, you know, kid, stop thinking about, you know, what we think of you or stop thinking about scoring. Think about everything else you do. And he's like, Tony, you're the biggest pain in the butt out there. You drive constantly. You earn three to four ejections. You're our best passer to set. Humbert scores or gets ejections because of your passes to him. Like you do so much more. And it was that, that, that talk and then the flight home that changed my mindset. Every day I went into a game and I thought of one thing. I thought of I was going to come out of that game giving everything I could and anyone who ever guarded me was going to remember, wow. That guy was tough to guard. He was swimming as fast as I could. And it just really helped me because as we know, and I'll talk about later, you know, I controlled the things I could control, which was my energy level, which was my passion and goals. That just came naturally. That's just, that's a reaction of me working my butt off all the time in practice. And that, that, that was a big moment in my career. Yeah, I think that's so important, that like common mission and feeling yeah. that, you know, sense of pride in that. I would just, you know, quickly add something to me that was so important with all of my coaches. You know, I even think of JT at Stanford, um, right, and back even to my dad, like people who aren't necessarily coaches, but they're there. One thing that really has changed my, you know, my, my journey has been coaches that let me know that they believe in me but they do so by challenging me. Um, 
I, I was watching the Michael Jordan documentary the other day, and he was talking about how his college coach, they had set up this play for their main player. Michael Jordan was the young one, hadn't really proven himself yet. And the coach told Michael Jordan, like, if you see the shot, it was for the game winner. If you see it, you take it. And he talked about how as a coach, like hearing that from, from the player's perspective, gave him that confidence that, okay, here's a challenge, but my coach believes I can do it. And I think that's so important to instill that belief in your players, especially at a young age, by giving them that challenge, right? And then letting them know, like, I believe you can do this. Or if they have a dream to go to the Olympics, do you believe in them? You know, let them know that. And you can do so even by like, hey, like, I, I believe you can get there. Like, let's work together to see how we can, you know, make this better. Or in a game, it's like, hey, you know what? Go for it. Have fun. Enjoy it. Like, you can do this, right? So giving that belief through a sense of, of challenge, um, which I think is so, so important. So I think uh, we're about to break out uh, into these, the first breakout group. Um, so yeah, so. All right, everybody, welcome back. Um, so I think next up, Tony, we're going to be talking about the 6A challenge. Yeah, we're going to be moving over and talking about what, what goes into the 6A challenge, what it takes to actually produce and what the athletes get out of it. And then uh, immediately after that, we're going to roll into sort of the technology behind the scenes. So what happens once we collect all that data from those, uh, the challenges and how we process it and you know what, what kind of insights we can gain from it. Cool. So again, thank you, everyone. Look, the, I truly believe that the greatest thing a coach can give an athlete is help identifying their weakness and help create a path to make it a strength. I'm going to give you two examples. The first was my last Olympics. You know, going into five Olympics, Coach Budovicic tells me, hey, Tony, I know you're really good out here and one of the best, but you have no legs compared to the European top players like Andrei Pradinovic, Filipovic, and name a, a bunch of Serbians, of course. But, but, you know, so for the next couple of years, for the next couple of years, I would just do more legs and less swimming. And it was mind blowing to me that I was playing some of the best water polo that late in my career. And it, it, and it killed me that I didn't know this earlier. The second way that that someone, a coach showed my weakness and gave me a path to success was my father right? At 96 Olympics, 14 years old, short, you know, small, slow, overweight kid wanted to be an Olympian in four years. Well, the first thing he said, and I think that's straight up, it's, it's important. Hey, you know, you're small, you're short, can't do anything about it, but that's a weakness. You're not as strong as these other guys and you're slow. So we have to get you faster. We, if you're short, you got to be the quickest guy out there. The most energetic is the most fit and you got to get stronger. And we created that path. I sat with a physical trainer and talked about how I'm going to get bigger and stronger. I, uh, I went and joined a swim team. And three years later, I made my first national team. And four years later, the youngest player uh, on the men's side ever. So it, it, as a coach, like you, understanding and finding that weakness is crucial, right? So Maggie and I created the challenge as a way to, to measure fundamental water polo skills in a standardized way around the world. Right. My son, who's six years old and he's in first grade, he takes all these tests. Right. I don't care what his report card is. The reason for the testing is to understand if he has a weakness in a category. If he's terrible in math, then I understand I need to work with him more in math. Like that is the that's just the, 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 the standard thing around the world. Yet in our sport, we don't have that. Right. Other sports, basketball, baseball, it's different with water polo. 
you need to know, you, there are certain skills that you have to have like aid beating, right? <laughs> like going over your hips, like picking up a ball correctly. So each one of these drills measures one skill that we, that we uh, consider essential to the game, right? For example, med ball measures uh, just your pure leg strength. But I'm gonna give you an example, right? So you, you all know I travel a decent amount around the world and I'm at a camp and I see this left-hander. I mean, he's six four, and to me, I'm always have this idea, you know, if I see a guy who's talented, I immediately wanna help this kid. So he's out there, he's, he's shooting the ball so well. He's very coachable when I change some things. We did a little bit of playing, he's blocking the ball really impressed with this kid. So this was day one. We ended up doing the 6A challenge. He couldn't hold 10 pounds over his head for five, for five seconds, right? Five seconds. And that there was a bunch of 10 to 12 year olds there who did it, who were doing more than five to 10 seconds, right? And so he was devastated. And I, I pulled him aside and I noticed that every time he had weight, his, his left hip, his left leg would buckle. And, you know, surprising enough, I've seen that a lot. It happens. Right, so talk, talk to the father about a couple months ago. He's now held that for about 40 seconds. He's a different player. They figured out the weakness in the hip uh, that they found out, so they strengthened it, and now that guy's a different player. Now he's one of the better players in that country. And it just blows my mind that he played water for eight years. He's been playing water pole for eight years, and now at 16 years old, no one told him that he didn't have strong enough legs or he had weak hips. These are things that we have to eliminate if we want uh, if we want this quantity all over the country. So by running the 6A challenge, we recommend two to four times a year, you're identifying these potential weaknesses, hopefully early on, right? You're measuring your athlete's fundamental skill um, and you get a base and you can monitor their improvement, right? You can see, you can see where, they, you know, where they stand. And also it's a new way to motivate your athletes, right? We talk about in, the, you know, in, in our breakout session about how do you motivate someone to do some of these boring over the hip drills. Well, this is a great way. This is a great way. Hey, you want to be better and then, you know, five, five thousandth in the, in the, in the six day challenge on this, you got to go over your hips. Let's do this over and over and over again. Right. Because it is fundamental to our game. Um, and as a coach, right. The challenge can, can help make decisions about how you structure your practices and trainings. And I truly have always believed this. And I said it in my, my, uh, uh, my breakout session before, Yes, we all need to collectively come together and, and practice and train at the same time and do some of the same things, but all of us are different and need to work differently. And we, we're big on stations here at 6 8 Sports. And you know what? If I have athletes that are weak in legs and then I have athletes that are weak in sprinting or over their hips, well, guess what? Their station's going to be mainly that because the idea, if we can get all of these athletes out of this red and in a higher level, they're going to be much more successful um, in life. So we've run the 6A challenge assessment over, on over 7,000 athletes from around the world, which has been super uh, interesting. And just collecting this data and identifying trends between regions, countries, ages, genders, uh, this has really allowed us to understand training resources and deficiencies and kind of where our sport is. So I'm gonna use here as example is Texas, right? Texas is one of the places we go most. Um, if I'm looking on this map, I'm seeing, you know, clearly Texas is, uh, has a great swim, swim base, right? They, they, clearly they've been taught going over the hip is great. Um, I'm gonna look at passing. Yeah, passing's, uh, you know, a little subpar, but so is it around everywhere, right? Everyone can work on passing. I'm gonna look at med ball that's pretty red, but at the same time, look at med ball in, in our, in, for the 16 under boys. From, so this is Texas versus 16 under boys uh, from Southern California. The, on, on all levels, our men's legs are weak. Our men's legs are weak. And I can tell you that we have the 16 under uh, women's data from, from uh, Southern California, and it's higher than the men's, right? That just shows you on our men's side, that's something that we really need to work on. Um, but the real thing that I'm looking at here, going back to our philosophy of finding that weakness, is the red. I'm looking at the red. What is this red? So we have med ball, Radar gun, obstacle course. This is where, as a coach, I need to focus. Of course, you don't give up on the 12.5 and the buoy on the vert, but these are the ones that you're going to help all your athletes achieve their dreams. So we're going to use the example. I'm going to take obstacle course, right? What are reasons for being weak in the obstacle course? So, uh, you know, lack of fitness, right? Because it's a longer, it's a longer one. Um, comfortability with swimming with the ball, zigzagging, going over your hips and recovering. 
These are all key reasons, right? Now I'm going to focus on now as a, as a coach, I'm going to start focusing on more breast kick, more lunging and recovering in Southern California. They play so many games. They're getting all these experiences, right? So how can I, as a coach outside of Southern California, mimic that? Well, I'm going to have a lot more swimming with the ball, zigzag, a lot more two on one, three on two, four on three counter situations, half court where they're just having to make uh, instant stop goes instant passes, instant, reads and i think that's going to be so important so i'm going to take that i'm going to use those drills and really focus on my team and see in two to three weeks when i test again did i get a better result right now i can use the 6a challenge game desk to see if this has helped him improve as a player and if it has i'm on the right path look coaches coaches can see improvement on this which is huge right we give you a a, a report of all your athletes and your teams but the biggest thing about this is not just for you as a coaches it's the athletes. They can also see it on their phone. They see how, where they're ranked. They see that they need to get better. And that's a better way for you to reach out to them, right? You, the, you gave the, the athlete the platform um, to understand his weakness. And, and now it's your job to create a path for him to make it a strength, right? We here are focused on quant quality, quality and not quantity. And what we want is for every athlete to understand what they need to improve in order to be great. And this is a great way for you to match kids from all over the world and say, this is their weakness, this is what I'm gonna fix. And guys, you see it, go do it. If you don't get better, then, then we know either there's an underlying problem that we can fix, great, you guys are helping them again, or it's a work ethic issue, which obviously they're not gonna succeed anyway. So this is the 6A challenge. Again, we'll, at the end, we'll have a lot of questions. It's pretty awesome that we have over 7,000 athletes on this. Um, the next part we're gonna get into is Carl. Um, he's gonna explain a little bit about um, technology that goes into 6A sports. And uh, this is really our, our, our bread and butter, our exciting, our exciting part, so thank you. All right. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit um, about sort of what goes into collecting this data, right? Um, as we, so what, what you're looking at right here is sort of a future iteration of um, what we call the, the game desk or the scoring desk app. It's, it's really going to kind of turn into the, the coaches app. Um, but this is, this is really how we walk an athlete through um, collecting the data. Right. So we have them, you know, we usually break up into groups in the camps and we have them do the drills. Um, and then there's an assessor and the assessor is at each station and they collect the data. So we're going to actually automate a lot of that um, because as you guys are probably aware, you know, the pool environment's pretty harsh. So right now we're kind of working on how do we, how do we reliably collect data without, you know, plowing through a bunch of electronic equipment each, each time we run the challenge. Um, but one of the things I want to start this session with is just a quick survey. You know, what technology do you guys use with your team today, right? Um, there's a ton of tools out there, everything from Google Sheets and, and Google Sites to uh, Team Snap and things to just organize the team and communicate with the team. But what tools do you use today to manage your players, your practices, your communications with your team? Um, it's important that we kind of start to get that feedback because we want to understand from you guys to what features would be good to roll into the program um, and what tools you're currently using that we may be able to integrate that that data and that uh, experience with for your to make it easier for you so if you can just drop that in the chat uh, that'd be great and then we can uh, we can kind of talk through any questions that you guys have about any of those things too as we go forward so technology in the sport, I mean, water polo, you know, when Tony and I and Maggie first started brainstorming about how we bring technology to the sport, we, we, we did a couple of proof of concepts. And one of the first ones, um, I, I really wish I had still the video of it. I'm sure it's around somewhere, but we built a, a goal and you know, we use optical sensors. And as you threw the ball and it would tell you exactly where the, the ball went into the goal. It was really cool, but there's, you know, it, it, would get destroyed the minute somebody would hit it with a ball or, uh, you know, get water. And so it is a harsh environment. So we are limited in what we can do um, with technology, like actually in the sport right now, I do the rules kind of constrain us and the safety aspect of it. Um, but it's just a very, very harsh environment. Right. Um, so we needed to find creative ways to gather data. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, the first thing we, we attacked was this standardized assessment, right. And how we, 
you know, sort of put kids through the exact same drills and measure how they improve and how we can apply the outcomes of those drills to actually performance data on the athletes. And um, one of the things we found was that there's, you know, we may see a kid once a year, maybe twice a year um, in some rare cases or some, some local clubs to, to where Tony and was, was more frequently active with camps, we'd see them, you know, three or four times a year, but that's still not enough to really get a good benchmark of data as to how a kid is performing. They may show up a little sore. They may show up um, just off their game for a day. So we really needed to be able to find ways, creative ways to start getting more data and more inputs on how a player is playing, not only performing in the game, but also just interacting with the game, right? Like how enthusiastic are they of a player? Um, cause that goes a long way to, you know, turning a kid from a, an average player to a, a really high performer, right? If they really love the sport, if they, you know, participate every chance they get, how, how many games do they play in a year? How involved are their parents? So it starts to be a ball of yarn that we, when you start tugging on it, there's a million different aspects that make up what an elite athlete is and, and how you get a kid from, you know, dreams of being an elite athlete to actually getting through that gauntlet of sacrifice and pain to actually becoming that elite athlete. Um, so we, could, we figured out we couldn't rely on any single source of data and we needed to have something that was really persistent, right? That started with a kid when they were little um, and then expanded and stayed with them as they went from team to team, club to club and, you know, experience to experience. So we really needed it, uh, to create a system that was flexible uh, scalable and, and future proof. So we started out with the 68 mobile app, right? And we launched it on the, the iTunes stores uh, for iPhone. Um, and it was really designed to have different audiences. Um, the, the entire system actually has sort of different focuses and different emphasis on each of the technology tools we use. It has a different audience and a different method for for collecting data, right? So the first one we started with was athletes and parents, right? We needed to get the athletes involved and we needed to get the parents involved because right? parents we know can be a coach's biggest nightmare, um, but they're also a big support system for the athletes. So we needed to you know, make a way for the parents who are new to the sport to be able to understand what's going on with the sport, be able to realistically benchmark their kids' abilities so they're not pushing them too hard or likewise not challenging kids. I mean, cause you know, they, they are, uh, Kids, if given the opportunity, will, especially early on, will would rather do just about anything rather than over the hip drills. So, um, so giving them sort of this, you know, beginnings and makings of a community with some great video content that's really engaging, um, and then this idea of benchmarking, and this was one of the things that was really sort of one of the initial missions of Six Eight Sports is benchmarking a athlete against their peers and against the entire water polo community of athletes, right? So a 12 year old girl could be in there and be benchmarked against other 12 year old girls. And we could even break it down to 12 year old girls in Southern California. Um, but beyond that, being able to understand from a, where does she fit against Maggie Steffens, right? Like what's, what's the goal that she should be striving to get to. So we really started to create that mobile app, the mobile app for iPhone with that in mind, right? That we're creating a, a portal for the athlete and the parents to really engage in the sport. Um, so when we take a look at our technology landscape, um, we really have sort of three inputs to what we call the 6.8 cloud. Um, so we have this 6.8 mobile app, um, and the app has some interactive features. Right? So it's not only us providing content for athletes, it's also the athletes providing us and the parents providing us with performance data. Um, we know it's not certified data. We know it's not um, you know, there's nothing that says a parent couldn't go in there uh, while they're scoring a game or a kid couldn't go in there and, you know, give themselves 100% shooting uh, percentage over time. But really, they're only cheating themselves uh, because the game data that comes from the, the 6.8 mobile app, it feeds into your stats, but it doesn't feed into any ranking algorithm. So you're not gaming the system by doing anything, you know, nefarious with, with stats in this. It really is a way for, A, for parents to learn to game. So, you know, you know, for youth games, it's a great way to, you know, track your kids' progress in a game. It really helps you understand what's going on in the water. Um, and, it, you know, from a parent's perspective, I have two kids that play the sport. It also makes you shut up, right? You're sitting there, you're, you're focused on the game, you're focused on what your kid's doing. So you're, you're actually engaged in the game in a different way than you would 
um, if you're second guessing coaching and ref calls and everything else. So, um, and the output from it is actually pretty cool because right? it flows right into the kids' stats. So we co see collectively playing time, shooting percentage over time, over their entire life. Um, we see how many shots, how many goals. So it, it just starts to create a really kind of neat picture of the investment that you're making in your kids uh, in the sport. And so the athlete profile is really the output of what we get from all these data sources. And this is what surfaced in the, in the mobile app. Um, we're gonna have a web property and the ability to share these profiles out to college coaches and to friends and things like that. Um, but what I've seen with my kids and their teams is that there's a good level of competition that starts to come across, especially when we start rolling in the, the game desk. Um, so the game desk is a new application. It's a new property that we've um, started to create. And what this is, is really it's designed for two purposes. Number one, to um, you know, sort of replace the paper score stat sheet that's a pain in the neck at the, at the scoring desk. Um, so real time while the game's going on, it's very easy to use. You touch the player, you touch the event that takes place in the water, and it records that. So it records the base level statistics for the game um, that you need for the scoring sheet. But beyond that, we're able to get much deeper um, analytics of what actually happened in the water. Um, as you touch player to player, you're indicating a pass or a transition of the ball from one player to the other. So we're actually starting to see passing patterns. We're starting to see, you know, is one player touching the ball 50% more than other players on the team. So we can get really, really deep on the analytics side of how players are performing in the water. Um, and we cover a lot more stuff uh, when it comes to stats on the game desk than we do on the scoring sheet. So from an assistant coaching standpoint, the ultimate goal here is that we'll be able to uh, give you guys real time plus minus, um, give you a plus minus algorithm that you can tweak and tune for your specific club and your specific needs. Um, so you'll be able to see pretty quickly during a game who's on their game and who's off their game. So we ran a couple tests with uh, some high school games last uh, last high school season. And what we found is that when at the end of the game, the kids just were dying to see the stats. And they started to understand that being the highest scorer didn't mean you contributed the most to the game. Right. We started to see defensive players really start to shine. And we started to see, you know, the plus minus shake out where the defensive players um, were really the ones kind of shaping the way the game, the game went down. So it was interesting to see not only the way the kids engage with the stats and no longer striving necessarily to be the, the number one goal scorer. Um, they were looking to dish off for the assists. They were looking to get the earned ejections um, because it really boosted their numbers at the end of the day. Um, so the six, eight cloud um, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of hosted for the techies in the group. It's hosted on Amazon. Um, and it was really designed as a cloud for, uh, um, internet of things, right? Connecting devices. So the, the, the way the system is designed really is that the athlete, we view the athlete as a machine in the system and the machine has all kinds of data inputs and, you know, is constantly data streaming at us. Um, so this scoring desk and this mobile app actually stream real time data at us. So we actually are able to do analytics in real time. We're able to um, evaluate these patterns in real time. And as we start looking at where we're going to go in the future, uh, we're trying to take a look at things like video analysis and uh, object detection and tracking, right? So a series of cameras and affordable cameras, not super expensive, thousands of dollars worth of cameras around a, a pool deck. Um, but, you know, maybe $50, $60 HD webcams um, set up in the correct way, could track a ball through the water, could track player numbers. Um, and so we could start getting more deeper analytics on player movement. Uh, so that's one area that we're doing research on. And the advantage of the way this cloud is designed is that we're leveraging off of work that's being done across other, um, in other industries, right? So a lot of the image processing uh, data that we're, we're uh, getting is from work being done by USGS and the way they track wildlife, um, the way they track movement of objects in water and rivers and streams. So that's gonna all be applied to 6-8 sports. So we, we have a, a really kind of unique system that allows us to grow and build and um, you know implement some really advanced features without a lot of cost and without a lot of time in R&D. Uh, likewise, when we start taking a look at other companies that are producing cool products, right? Toka um, that makes a great, you know, ball uh, training machine for soccer. Um, as they start 
you know, coming out with smart balls for volleyball, soccer, things like that. Um, we'll start designing drills that can work with those other pieces of technology. Um, and we'll fold that all into six, eight sports and how we evaluate an athlete's performance and engagement. Uh, so again, you know, it's, it's more than just stats. We're looking at way more than just how does a player, you know, how high can they get out of the water? How, how much do they, um, you know, how many goals do they score in a game? What we're really trying to do is benchmark them against other athletes. Um, and the reason is to just give a very realistic picture back to the athletes, back to the perform, uh, parents on how, you know, how they're doing with their investment in the sport. Um, areas we're gonna go in the future is really kind of taking a look at all of those other aspects that shape an athlete, right? So how do we take into account grades um, and watching for trends in grades, right? So if we see a kid who's, you know, straight A student, straight A student playing a bunch of games, and then we start to see the grades drop off, and then we start to see the game performance drop off, you know, that's a red flag, right? It's a red flag that A, the kid might be losing interest in the sport. It's a red flag that there might be something else going on. It's a good indicator that the coach um, maybe should start to pay attention to that particular athlete because they may be at, at risk for quitting the sport or, uh, or just be maybe living a miserable life at the moment and water polo is a, a great outlet for them. So this, um, this system behind the scenes, again, you know, it's constantly feeding these different algorithms and it's, it's feeding these um, different uh, models where we're benchmarking kids on multiple different dimensions, not just, uh, you know, basic statistics. So this is a view of the, the game desk, a, a little bit bigger view, but you can see, you know, from an interface perspective, there's a lot going on. Um, but basically we have, uh, you know, we have one team on top, we have one team on the bottom. Um, substitutions, you just tap a player, you tap the position you want them to go in. Uh, there's really sort of no indication as to, or no, no restriction as to who can play where. Um, but then you just really tap a player and you tap shot, you tap player, you tap goal. Um, and then you can get your shooting percentage. Every time you get a goal or an ejection, we pop up a position screen, oh, and a, a way to capture more details about an action. Um, so you can place the shot in the water, you can place it in the goal. Um, and then you, once you save that, it saves it as a piece of data against that game. So we can report against it. So we'll be able to show you a, a heat map uh, that shows on a particular player where they've been shooting in the water and then also where they've shot over time. So all these games, again, roll up. They're all associated with the athletes. So we have a full record of an athlete's um, growth as they, as they go. So um, I'm going to stop here. Um, I think it's time for another breakout. And then, you know, like I said, if there's any questions on the technology side of things, just uh, go ahead and you can drop them in the chat and we can hit them during the next Q&A. We breaking out. Yeah, how many of these exercises have you come up with, uh, Misha Osic? <laughs> Misha's a great guy, man. I learned so much from him. I've, I've also had the ability of, you know, I had his son that played for me in high school in America, Ivan. Oh, Ivan did? Ivan was yeah, Ivan played, Ivan played for me in, in the United States. He played on my club team. 
played on my high school team. And of course, you know, this was one of my all time favorite kids in the world. We still talk brother Pero and his dad. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I always tell people, we don't invent anything. We just borrow from everybody. And, and that's why I don't have a problem sharing. <laughs> but he, he's a great coach. He was on that conversation that we talked about. I know. That's why, that's why I asked. Because <laughs> he was my coach for about four years. So yeah, some it, of the it, you're doing, uh, looks like I did as well. You know, <laughs> that some of that old, uh, that old group, you know, Strumbich and Rudich and... Uh, Dad, I think everyone's back here. Now it's everyone, huh? All yeah, right, you gotta okay. love. Right. We'll I'm talk like, later. I'm from Rico to the whole group. I'm like, who did? <laughs> what are you saying? You gotta love that about the waterfall community, right? <laughs> all right, guys. Sorry about that. I'll mute. Um. All right. So I think we're gonna head into some Q and A, and um, Brenda, you know, is open. So if you guys also have questions specific to anybody, please write that in the chat. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. So. Oh, we did have, um, before we start the questions, uh, we have a coach, Sean Stringham here from Utah, who we've worked with a lot with 6-8 sports. Um, and so, Sean, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and just share maybe some examples of how you've used the 6-8 challenge or how you've used Tony and myself um, to help build your, build your club uh, as an example. And then we'll get into main questions, maybe like a minute or so. That sounds good to you. Yeah, no problem. I'd, be, I'd love to. We, uh, I got involved with Tony and Maggie uh, three or four years ago when they were just starting to visualize the 6-8 challenge and I think was a, one of the first clubs to actually use 6-8. Uh, from that time, we have uh, run the 6-8 challenge once to twice a year. We use that data initially, to, just as Tony and Maggie have uh, indicated in terms of tracking those individual athletes uh, and seeing how they progress over time. Uh, it's always amazing to be able to have that data and see and be able to share that information with parents and show them what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, how they compare to other athletes across the country. Uh, as a developing region here in Utah, we, I love to be able to show that, like, as they just indicated, like, this is what we need to get to in order to compete with California teams or compete in Texas. And we've seen that and by a data driven approach have really seen some improved performance from our athletes. And the kids love it. Uh, they get excited for the time to do the 6-8 challenge. They like cheer each other to see how high they can go on the vertical leap or any of the other. So it's a gr we use it both from a team culture standpoint as well as from a data standpoint. Uh, from a game tracking standpoint, we're super excited to roll that out. We were just getting ready to go with that and use our entire spring season to gather that data before the quarantine came in. Uh, but my, my uh, women's coach, Alexis Courtney, and myself, I uh, had some experience with that at the winter uh, camp at Colorado Springs and had a fantastic experience with that and excited to in integrate that in. So thanks. Awesome, Sean. Thank you. Um, so one question we got earlier from Kelsey Thompson. Tony, I think this would be a great one for you. Was she asked about, um, you know, how can we during this time in quarantine, but also in the winter seasons when we don't have a pool to, you know, test dry land? And I know like with the dry land challenge that we're working on, maybe you could, you know, talk about that just briefly. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we're actually on Monday, we're going to come out with a six, eight challenge dry land. So <laughs> we, we figured it was about time and that's just the way kids can have fun where they stand in certain drills. But in general, I think testing is there for a reason, right? You want to see if they're improving. So you come up with your core drills. We have tons on our app. We'll have our dry land challenge if you want to do that, or if you want, to incorporate some of your own drills. By the way, that same goes for our 6A challenge. We always want you to incorporate your own drills, or if you think this is you know, not as beneficial for your team, go ahead and use some of the others. But for me, I think you take some of these top drills, maybe it's a high knees or burpees in two minutes or full squat uh, thrusts in two minutes, and then test them, and then see what they do. And now you're gonna see that they're actually gonna get a lot more um, excited and now I got to beat that. I got to beat that. And then if you incorporate their team, now all of a sudden the team's going and they're all on zoom going, no, she's doing it wrong. Well, <laughs> you know, and it's, I think it's a, it's a great way to engage there. But the other thing is, so if you don't have a pool, staying fit is huge and staying fit. Um, people have a lot of ideas for it. My, th my theory is you have to get your heart rate up. You don't realize in water polo, our heart rate's up to 170, 180, half 50% of the time. And now our kids are here thinking by doing a couple push-ups and sit-ups that they're staying fit. They're not, right? They need to be able to really feel like, 
that, that dying, and it doesn't have to be two hours. It can be 45 minutes of, of jumping and lunges. And nowadays, I mean, Orange Theory, Iconics, these are all gyms that, that are giving free at-home workouts. And I personally have been looking at some and writing them down going, I'm going to use this for myself and some of these for the kids, yoga, uh, stuff like that. So I think there's a lot to do at home. But again, don't forget the homework. I talked in our advanced session about um, putting kids and asking them on five on six, give me a, give me a, give me an, uh, when the ball's at four and you're X three or you're X two, where should you be? They should be able to answer that within 30 seconds. If they can't, well, maybe we have to do a whole day of going over what every position um, is. And I see a lot of times always play, kids are asking, well, you know, I play this side mostly. Well, what happens if you play the other side? You're just going to give up a goal? No, you got to learn how to play all positions. So I think that's so valuable. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so we have another question that um, I think I'll answer. And then Rico, maybe you could follow up with this one as well. Just we'll give some two short answers to this is um, there is a question about, you know, especially on counterattacks and on the offensive attack, how do you teach reads um, and how to finish in that transition or that counterattack? And something that I just talked about, you know, in my session is, you know, I broke it down into what to me is the most important part of water polo and it's space. And I talked about, you know, the three steps or three things to think about, especially as a coach and how I see it as a player. And I know I've talked a lot about this with Tony as well is one, can we create space and how can we create space Two, read the space? And this is where that IQ is really developed and whereas coaches at a younger age and experience, can we linger in that read phase so that later on that read phase is short? And then can we attack the space, whether it's on offense, so a counter, can I create the, you know, cutoff like Tony talked about in his drill? Can I read the open space and then can I fill it on the counter attack? So I think a way of teaching that is, you know, can we teach kids about space, um, create read attack, right? And letting them kind of develop that for themselves as well as show it on a whiteboard have them do exercises on paper, show them on video, um, and even like feel free to do it on land. I think that's so, so important. So creating drills like keep away, we've talked about in isolations where they're able to create the space to read it, make that decision, or maybe you're whispering in their ear what possible decisions could be, and can we attack that? So Rico, I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, I, the only thing I would add to that, and I totally am in agreement, I mean, we, we basically do the same thing, is just the, the only thing I would add to is time and space. Because, you know, you, you have to understand that when you, you are creating space, so it doesn't matter if it's just creating this much space, you know, to help, or is it kind of attack how you're creating that space. There's a time involved. So you have to make sure that when you are drilling, you keep decreasing the time to allow the execution to increase in, in, let's say, possibility. You know, don't always do something with just doing it. Now you say, okay, you got 15 seconds and you're gonna have to help out here. Or you have 12 seconds and you have to get the ball to the wing as fast as you can. So adding the time effort to the space, I think it would make it a perfect way to attack and creating execution. And again, you have to just keep in mind time and space. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, we're going to do one more question, then end with a slide and hopefully take a group photo. So in about three minutes, we'll ask you guys to put your videos on. Um, but Brenda, I think you're still here. Um, one of the questions was just talking about how to retain athletes um, in the sport and just motivating them. And so if you could, I don't know if you have a, an answer for that to just share with the group, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it starts at a young age, right? Whenever you first in, have interactions with your athlete, like teach them the love of the game. Can you find um, role models that represent them in our sport? Um, that's something that's really important to me is the diversity in the sport. So can you get familiar or familiarize yourself with the national team or with collegiate players that you can then tell your athlete like, hey, look in so-and-so, she's from Utah. She's, you know, 5'8". She has two siblings just like you. You could be her. You know, she's playing at this college. She's, you know, on the pipeline track to make an Olympic team because representation really matters. So I think that is very helpful. And also just the more we can explain them to different levels of the game like letting your athletes know like hey here's this college game or here is this team that's greater hey um pro records in the u.s let's go watch them play and kind of um let them know all the 
endless possibilities there are in this sport. Like Rico was saying, right, there's opportunities overseas and at his club team, he was able to help players um, go on to college and then play overseas. So there are a lot of possibilities. We just have to make sure that we are letting our athletes know that they're out there and, and believing in them and giving them maybe um, a path. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, all of us have played professionally abroad. And I think that's a reminder to your athletes, like, like Rico is saying, you can play in college, you can play at the high level, you can play professional water polo, like remind them that that's a, a path you can take. Um, and then at six, eight, we want to just help with the exposure. Like that's a challenge in our sport. And Brenda talked about just presenting role models and exposure to games. Um, so we have one more slide to just show you guys what it could look like to be a part of the six, eight team. And we actually have a free code for you guys to all try out the app. Um, we're coming out with an Android version soon. Um, and then we're gonna take a group photo. So I don't know if Carl can share that screen. If not, I will. There we go. Tony, I don't know if, do you wanna um, just let them know what possibly it looks like and then we'll do a group photo, share the code. Sure, you know, we have here the, the Accept, the 6.8 app and our, our tech tools. Um, obviously that's what we talked about a lot with the game desk, with the, with the app itself. Our at-home challenges and trainings, we're coming out with a circuit right now. Um, more and more circuits, a leg day. I'm so big on leg strength. I showed you med ball, how <laughs> we're weak in this country, especially on the men's side. So I focused a lot on, on the legs. Um, you know, clinics and, and challenges, what we're, we're gonna start to do is is reach out to more of these Olympians and our, our, our friends like a Brenda and, and really try to get her out there and we'll get a certified coach. I know we have Johnny Vega, we have Sean Stringham here online. They're both certified coaches. Um, joint branding, we have clubs like Sean's, uh, Sea Wolf in New Zealand, that they're six, eight back. That means they're using all of our technology. Um, they're using our reports to see where their kids stand and so they can use their weaknesses and make them strengths. Um, and then, you know, they become part of this global team, right? We're all together and they get to see where everyone else is and all their rankings and standings and, and whatnot. And again, we have the game desk that'll come out. Uh, we'll start be using for major competitions right away when we can start playing. Uh, consulting, you know, that's something that we have so many resources, so many coaches and players here. And we are literally, we, we, we've already done it for a couple uh, uh, clubs and countries and now we're moving into more countries so please just reach out to us to that and again the coaching certification I think that's the number one thing we need in this country is a way for coaches to understand you know any which drill or any which way that they need to train so at least on a base level we know that our kids are getting are getting taught the correct motions and then when you get older and later on in college and stuff we, we, we know you can do the right thing but our young first-time coaches need more help. So we're, that's what we're focused on. 6-8 team is the code. Give it to yourself, your friends, your, your, your teammates, uh, your, your athletes, and please play around with it. And we, one thing about us, we are very humble, all of us. So you go ahead and write what your th thoughts are, and we're not going to delete that email, um, good or bad. We want to make this the best product for you and uh, your athletes. So please give us any info you have. Carl, are you gonna change it or what do we got? Oh, team I think that's uh, I think it's time for team photo. So I'll just stop sharing here. All right, how do we do team photo? Are we doing it? Yeah, yeah. everyone turn on your video and they'll put it in gallery and we'll take a fun team photo. When do we know what's happening? Are we just supposed you to never look good? Know, you never know. You just never know. You just so you try to look good. Time. Just smile. Just I'm smile. I'm good, though. I'm good. Don't worry about Stop it. Stop pretending like you don't know, Tony. Just there smile. Is. Come on. Okay, that was another Bye. tip she's always told me. Always Bye. smile. Bye. 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 Hold it a little bit longer. Ready? One, two, three. And one more, one more. Keep oh, smiling. <laughs> one, two, three. Perfect, thank you. See, and I put in you. beauty. There's, you know there's a beauty mode on here I've been using, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. That was awesome. We hope you learned something. Um, and please, like Tony said, like give us feedback. If you want 
you know, to learn more about something or good, bad, whatever, we are here to help and learn as well. So thank and all you. your questions you guys have asked and sent before, we're going to mm -hmm. try to get back to you and get answer everyone's questions. Just so you know that give us a little time. <laughs> have a great weekend. Peace. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Six, Thanks. Six, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you from South Africa. <laughs> Thank you, Kelsey. Oh, Brenda. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Hi, sorry. I had one last question, but we ran out of time from our- Um, uh, You can email no? me yeah. at polophorvia at gmail.com. Polophorphia. Oh, the number four. Now we all four. know. Yeah. <laughs> all good. All good. Oh, also, we loved having Madison Lewis on our team this year. She was such a great addition. Oh, I miss her. Her energy kept me motivated so many times. <laughs> yes. Maddie, do I get out of here or what's going on? <laughs> Yeah, you totally, you're welcome to leave. We're going to keep the room open for a few more minutes, but yeah, our event's over. Oh, yeah. Thanks for joining us, guys. Rico, it's time for a, a, a Prosecco. Oh, hey, hey, I'm on my way. <laughs> See ya, guys. Tony, Sorry, that's, that's not even that's, fair. That's the only thing that will keep me away from water polo. A good prosecco. I'm out. Sorry. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. The gauntlet has been thrown. I'm out. Thanks, everyone. Great job. See you, guys. Thanks, Thanks Sean. Sean. Tim, what's up? How's it going? It's going, man. It's going. It was yeah. good. What'd you yeah. think? No, it was real good. It was good to ask some questions. And Maggie did, you know, had some good questions. Maggie, just some different ways to uh, I explain things. So it's always good, you know. Cool. I'm, you know, I'm desperate for any type of water polo with this whole thing going on. So yeah. I'll always take it. So All right. thanks again. Well, awesome, Tim. All right, man. I'll get off so you guys can get to work. <laughs> I'm sharing my screen. All right, so we, that's it.